Hi guys, it has turned into a quite a pleasant spring evening here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the heart of Texas on this fairly quiet Wednesday, March 18, 2020 as we prepare for lockdown in Austin, Texas and this is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles. But as you probably know, this week we're doing a special series, the Coronavirus Chronicles, here on Collapse Chronicles. And as part of that series, I am very thrilled to have back, for the third time in a year, uh, our good friend from Australia. We're going to go all the way down to Canberra, Australia, where it is my great pleasure to bring back Australian science writer Julian Cribb, who... If you have listened to our first two interviews, which I encourage you to, Julian writes about existential risks. So I thought definitely we had to bring Julian on the show for uh, the Coronavirus Chronicle. So come on and say hi to the folks for the third time, Julian, and we're going to step right into this. Good day, Collapsitarians. Okay, so uh, well, we're going to... I'm going to reword my first question uh, a little bit uh, with you. So I'm going to make this a two-part question. Number one, is coronavirus an existential risk? And whether it is or not, could coronavirus, in your opinion, be the trigger that we have been talking about for all these years that could be the beginning of the end for global industrial civilization, and why or why not, Julian Grubb? Well, the first question, it's not uh, an existential risk. An existential risk is one in which the human species could get wiped out. It's already very clear that uh, coronavirus only kills a small amount of us. Uh, it is, however, a catastrophic risk, uh, and it's probably more of a catastrophic risk for the global economy. Uh, than it is a health risk. So on the list of risks, and there are there are 10 uh, major catastrophic and existential risks all working together at the same time now, I would put it fairly low. It, compared to climate change, compared to a global famine, compared to a nuclear war, it's a blip. It's a blip compared, compared to those, but it's not being treated like a blip, at least here, here in Texas. So you already kind of answered uh, well, you, you're already answering, uh, writing down my, my list of, uh, of, of questions. So obviously, you consider the, the knock-on effects to the global economy to be a bigger threat, at least if you're a human, than the actual threat of the virus. If, if, if it doesn't actually kill you, probably you're going to be more affected by the knock-on effects to the global economy than the virus itself. Is that a safe bet? I, I would think so, but I, I also hope that rather like the coronavirus, the global economy can recover quite quickly uh, from the onset of the virus. I think uh, you know the, it's a very resilient thing, the economy, and, and people will, will buy shares when they're cheap and, and it'll, things will bounce back fairly quickly. But when is, is a good question. Probably not for a few months. So fairly quickly is is a few months. Uh... I'd say the, the New York Stock Exchange doesn't like remaining depressed for too long. You know, its instinct <laughs> is to is, is to buy, buy, buy uh, at when when prices are low, and you know this is the opportunity. It's certainly the opportunity for physical silver, which is below twelve dollars an ounce today. I've noticed for the first time in how many years, but. Uh, that, that's, all, that, that, that's a whole nother story. So what are, uh, so how are you reading this? I, I, you're the first person I've talked to from Australia. So give us the Australian perspective. How, I, I mean, good Lord, you, were, you guys were already reeling from those fires, right? And now you have coronavirus coming in as like a one-two punch. What's it doing? What's, what's going on down there in Australia? Well, basically, uh, Australia is a very good case study because we started off with a major drought, a really serious drought where we're actually importing grain, which we normally don't do, things like that. The drought was followed by serious, extremely serious bushfires, the worst in our history, and now we've got the coronavirus. And what this illustrates is 
the, the, the issue of existential risk, you get a series of hammer blows, one crisis hitting after another, and in many cases you're just not prepared for them. Uh, governments are not prepared for them. They do not understand that it is a case of human survival in the long The ten existential risks that we are facing, only one of which is disease, uh, are all coming together at the same time. At this moment, no government on earth has a policy for human survival. That's a bit of a worry. So, all right, let, let's just, just dive right into this whole thorny subject. Uh, now, I, I, again, I am not that familiar with the Australian government's re reaction. To tell us, a, just educate us a little bit about how, how the Australian government is reacting to this. Is it similar to what Donald Trump is doing up here? And do you think the, the government response to, we're going to limit this to coronavirus now, do you think what you're seeing is, is, is it overblown? Are they coming down too strong? Are they not reacting strongly enough to the threat? Or do you think they have it about right in Australia? Well, the Australian government came into this having been taken totally by surprise by the bushfire crisis. Right, so they were determined not to be taken by surprise twice, but they were. But we have not got enough test kits in Australia. Um, we have got far too few intensive care units for, for nursing people who get the virus badly. So uh, we are totally unprepared, rather like America. Um, we came there too little and too late. And that means more people are going to die than needed to die strictly. And if you compare us with what is happening in Asia at the moment, China, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, they've all got on top of this virus very, very, by acting very quickly and, and doing a lot of testing and finding out who's infected. Now, both America and Australia are in the position of not knowing who is infected. Therefore, we can't control the epidemic. Uh, so we, we, we really are in a bad place. All right, you're um, hitting the, you need to back off with your, yeah, I don't know what you're, there you go, all right. I don't quite know why it does that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, all right. So, uh, so oh, you're God. not you're you're not in, yeah. The, the your camera likes to go back and that's all, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Uh, so you are not impressed by. So basically, the lesson you're getting out of this, and probably not a surprise to you is that the lesson that we can take is is, is that governments are, are, are not prepared even for something of the level of coronavirus and what is the lesson that that we can take away but both i guess from the bushfires and the coronavirus that uh what does it say about government preparedness to deal with uh, what's coming down the pike well, basically, in Western democracies, government preparedness is hopeless. Uh, I mean, you've got the case of Italy, we've now got the case of Spain, and so on. They're all evidence of very low levels of government preparedness, very low levels of mental preparedness by the population at large. The difference between the Western democracies and Asia is that the Asians had a bad scare with the SARS virus, uh, and they have now got in place all of the things that they need to do to act very quickly. They shut down their societies very fast, they have lots and lots of test kits, uh, and they have all the treatment that is necessary to put a, put a lid on it. And you've actually seen in, in China, the number of new cases is coming down dramatically. I think there was one new case yesterday in, in Wuhan, which is astonishing. The Chinese got right on top of this, so have the Koreans, so have the Singaporeans, so have the Hong Kongers. So, so really, they've done exactly the right thing. Uh, what's gone on in the United States is atrocious, uh, to my, my view, because Trump has been pretending it, it isn't an issue uh, for, for going on two months now. Um, but he's turned. I mean, yeah. he's flipped in the past week on that. A big pardon? But, 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 but Trump has flipped 180 degrees, at, at least publicly. Whether he believes what he's saying or not is another matter. But, he, but publicly, to save his political career, he had to flip. Yes, absolutely. He was forced to do it because he was surrounded by people telling him he had to. But basically you're seeing the price in both the United States and Australia of having a scientific illiterate at the helm of the country. 
Now, these people do not understand science. They're totally unprepared when these things happen to find the right solutions, to activate the right processes within government. So more Americans are going to die because of that. And also the American healthcare system is, is in a bit of a mess, I gather. So uh, more Americans will die as a result of that too. So it is going to be quite a serious issue for, for America to, to get that curve under control. And, and as you were saying earlier, the, the, the economic fallout of this, is the economic uh, fallout going to last a lot longer than the actual direct health effects, in your opinion? What we don't know at this stage is how bad coronavirus is going to be in places like Africa and India. Uh, you know, if there's an explosion, as there was in the 1918 flu uh, pandemic uh, in, in, in those countries, and it can be a slow-burning um, explosion because they don't travel as much as we do. So, uh, you know, it may take longer to get there, but it may then last longer circulating around the planet and coming back in new forms. Uh, so, you know... You just can't predict that at this stage. It's, it's, it, the, this virus is too new. It's behaving unlike any other virus that we've seen. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're still getting, you know, the idea of, of what it is and how to control it. Uh, yes, the economics is going to be painful, but I think it, the, the world recovery will shrug it off eventually, uh, as will most people who get the infection itself. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't... This is not the end of the world in, in that sense. But, but... The thing is, pandemics are part of this great complex of major catastrophic risks that humanity is facing. So resource depletion, uh, loss of food security, nuclear weapons, you know, all the new weapons that, that, that are uh, uh, going around, uh, the collapse of ecosystems, and this virus starts with the collapse of ecosystems. So we should talk about cutting down rainforests, because that's where we get new viruses. Uh, you know, we've got to stop cutting down rainforests. That's where all these new viruses are coming from at the moment. They're coming out of wild animals and they're going into humans because humans and their livestock make up 97% of the biomass on the planet, right? So these viruses have got nowhere else to go. If the monkeys or the bats that have them uh, are, are, are being killed off, the viruses have to move sideways into humans. Humans and those viruses are coming into contact for the first time and that enables the viruses to jump species. So if we want to seal that particular wound off, we're going to have to stop cutting down rainforests. But do you see any evidence that we're stopping cutting down rainforests? No, I don't. I'm going to look at what's going on in Brazil. It's, uh, it's insane. Uh, African rainforests are still getting ploughed under for agriculture. It's all being done for the sake of agriculture. And agriculture is going to collapse in the mid-century anyway due to climate change and, and uh, scarcity of resources. So... You know, it's not the right thing to do. There are, there are plenty of ways to feed the world securely, but they don't involve agriculture. Uh, so, you know, um, we're going to have to change how we eat if we want to head off that particular uh, issue. And the other thing is, if, you know, if I could recall the, the Black Death, happened 700 years ago, the effect in, in Italy was about 20% uh, of the population were killed. But in, in Britain, it was about 50 to 60%. And the reason for that was that there was a wet summer and the, uh, the grain got moulded, got mildewed, and that poisons people. So the immune systems of, of British people were undermined already when the Black Death hit. So you sometimes get these synergies. So beware of war, beware of, of, of famines and things like that, because they can make epidemics like the coronavirus epidemic much worse. And we're going, well, at least the Northern Hemisphere, I mean, we're, we're heading into, uh, in, into summer. So, I mean, if we don't have this cleaned up by the time the heat cranks up, I, you know, I mean, it starts heading towards, uh, you know, 100 degrees, well, about 42, 43 uh, Celsius by the middle of May in Austin. Uh, and, and so... What, what I'm thinking is we better get through this pr pretty quick because it, it's going to be kind of like a like what happened in Australia, this one-two punch. And if we're still reeling from coronavirus, we're going to start seeing these cascades of these different things. And uh... That is the point about the 10 existential risks. There's always another one round the corner just waiting to hit you. 
and sometimes they are going to hit you all at the same time. So, you know, we're not prepared. No, no government in the world is thinking about this issue at the moment. They may be thinking about individual issues like climate change and so on, but they're not thinking about the whole complex of threats. And that's what we've got to get through to people. We've got to use the coronavirus um, episode, the fright that people have got, to, to help them understand what it is that, that humans have done to their planet uh, and, and how we've created a threat to our own future. And there is time to hit it off. There is time to reduce all of these threats. But we're not focused on that at the moment. We're just panicking and going from one thing to another. Can I point out one more aspect about the coronavirus that we don't know as yet? Um, it's well known that Legionella, which is a bacterium, is transmitted through air conditioning systems in hotels, in buildings, in offices, office blocks, in power apartments and so on. We have a common air conditioning system you can move Legionella. Can you move coronavirus? Nobody knows just yet. So summer may not be such a good thing, you know, if everybody's going into air conditioning and you can't open the windows and things like that. So we need to get an answer on that one pretty damn quick. Right. Yeah, yes, we do. Okay. So you, you mentioned about uh, a minute ago, so let, let's segue into this and not so much the government reaction, but the general public reaction. Uh, at least what I am seeing uh, here in Austin, Texas, and, and, and that the toilet paper war videos actually started in Australia with the fist fights in uh, Woolworths uh, over, over the toilet paper. I am not seeing people learning a lesson about uh, our relationship with the planet, I am seeing people in complete freak out panic, uh, panic buying, hoarding, at least in the US, I don't know about Australia, gun sales, ammo sales, going through the roof. Uh, I, I, I don't see any lessons being learned here. I, I, see, I, I see the first hints of Mad Max uh, unfolding, is what I see. Well, you're, you're quite correct, Sam. I mean, our populations, and yours in particular, have been trained by Hollywood to panic when there is a, there is a viral breakout. Because the, how many movies can you think of, you know, where everybody goes into screaming panic and you know, only two or three people survive? There's a ton of movies like that. Uh, we have actually scripted the panic for ourselves. Now, toilet paper is one thing, uh, but at the moment, there is no city on earth that can feed itself. So all of our food comes into cities by long, very fragile food chains. A, lot, a whole lot of trucks and planes and ships bringing our food to, to New York, to London, to Paris, to Moscow, wherever it is. Now, if those chains break down, the toilet paper fights are going to be absolutely nothing compared <laughs> to the fights that we'll see over food. Right? The supermarkets will be empty in 48 hours and they will not be able to restock them. So if, there's a, if there are major breakdowns like that, that is the time when you really... Because half the world is living in cities now. Yeah. So half the world cannot feed itself. They are utterly dependent on these 2,000 kilometers long food chains to feed them. If, if any of those fracture, for whatever reason, shortage of, of, of water, a shortage of oil, um, a war, a climate crisis, uh, then you will see panic on a much larger scale than you're seeing it at the moment. So is this uh, is this a drill for for things to come? Is this the uh, is this the appetizer for Mad Max? It's a wake up call. It, it is saying that we have damaged the earth so severely, and we are now so many, uh, and our, our resource demands are so great that we are creating a series of very unstable situations, whether they're disease situations or resource or food security situations. But we're going to keep on running into these kinds of things. For example, we're running out of water in, in a, a whole lot of, about a third of the world's countries are now, you know, very, very short of water. And that means they're going to be very, very short of food. So you're going to see these catastrophes, you know, um, unfolding like a series of dominoes. Yeah, it's not one big catastrophe unless someone pushes the nuclear button, but there's going to be a series of these things going on, and climate is going to make them harder, um, disease outbreaks will make them harder. 
We need governments especially to wake up that we are facing an existential threat to the survival of the human species. And, and, and one reaction from the government sector, I, I mean, do you think, you know, judging by what I'm see, seeing here, I mean, what, what's it going to look like when two billion people are, are, need to go on higher ground and the people living on the higher ground don't, don't want to move over because they don't have anywhere to move to? I mean, I, I, I just think it's a perfect snapshot into into 2050 or or, or, or sooner than that. That's my reason yeah, it's, of it. It's a bit hard to tell when uh, we're going to actually melt Antarctica. Uh, it probably will take 300, 500 years to melt it all. But when it does, it's going to go up to the 20th story on the <laughs> on the tower buildings in New York or, or Miami or wherever it is. You know, so uh, about two thirds of Louisiana is going to be you know seabed. Uh, so, so there are those kinds of things that, that, that are coming, but they're coming more slowly than these more immediate uh, re reactions. Um, and look, as I say, this is the wake-up call. We have the opportunity to become prepared to minimise the impact of these things, but we're just not doing it. We're letting them happen, and then we're panicking about it when it does happen. We, we sure are. So anyway, I need to... Uh... For, for my final closing question uh, is, I, I, I wanna, I, th this is one of the stories where, where I actually can to try to find some lemonade in the, in, in the lemons. Now some people, I don't think you are one of the people, Julian, who is a fan of collapsing global industrial civilization and the economy, that you're, you're, you're not one of the deep green resistance movement pushing for that? Oh no, I'm not. I, I would rather humans survived and I'd rather we managed our population down back to around about two, two and a half billion. Uh, you know, everybody living at a reasonable standard of living and with enough to eat. Uh, that's going to take us a hundred years to do that uh, if we don't have a catastrophe in the meantime. But Look, there are upsides, there are bright sides to, to even the coronavirus. I mean, I'm predicting with everybody isolated, we're going to see a flowering of the arts. People are going to write books, plays, operas, you know, they're going to compose things while they're locked up in their, in their homes. Uh, so, that, you know, humans are very inventive creatures and they find the way to make the best out of everything. Uh, I'm going to go away and bake some bread, you know, so I think that's a great thing to do when you're locked in your home. Oh, we just posted uh, the, the first coronavirus poem, uh, Ode to the Coronavirus, I just published here on Collapse Chronicles. I, I, I think a lot of these stories and poetry and songs are, are going to be fairly dark. Uh, we're we're, we're going to see more dark, ironic humor in our, in our art and, and music, but I'm, I'm talking more about the non-humans and uh, is this a is this from the point of view of our fellow earthlings? Do you can you imagine that they might be looking at this a little bit differently than, than humans and seeing and seeing a bright side to the coronavirus? Uh, the coronavirus is not going to even slightly reduce the human population. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, our impact on the planet is not likely to be much reduced although there will be a pause in our carbon emissions. The issue is people have to understand that coronavirus and all the other viruses like it, HIV, Hendra virus, Marburg, Ebola, all of these things come out of ruined rainforests. We have got to stop wrecking yeah. rainforests. We've got to start putting back rainforests and forests generally, restoring the wild world. That is one of the antidotes uh, to new pandemics. Uh, restore the wild world and the wild world will look after itself. Okay, let's, uh, let's make that our rallying cry. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping a, a few of these people that I see uh, getting in fistfights over toilet paper are going to go home and start uh, politicking for restoring the rainforest. I don't see it, Julian, but uh, it, 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 it could happen, I guess. It depends how many wake-up calls we get, you know, when there are water crises, when cities are collapsing due to food shortages and things like that, people will start to revise their thinking. At the moment, 
we're just panicking over a small thing, a blip on, on the radar of existential risk. That, that, that is the good summation of it as any of I have heard all week. But Julian Krebs, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come revisit us here at Collapse Chronicles. Guys, if you enjoyed what Julian uh, had to say, please thumb up this video and go find my other two interviews with Julian from the past year. And subscribe to Collapse Chronicles when you're over here for more of these videos. And Julian Cribb, the most important thing is keep up the good fight, brother. Thank you. Bye, guys.